evacuation areas is Hi guys, good evening. Sorry about that. Uh, our audio is now on. Hopefully y'all can hear me. My name is Brandilyn Karen. I am a public information officer for the Southwest Area Incident Management Team 3 under the Incident Commander Dave Gesser. Tonight we will have our Incident Commander as well as Operations Trainee Corey Carlson available to give us an update on what's been happening on the fire and then we'll have them available for questions. If you guys have questions, go ahead and start dropping those in the comments below for either of those speakers, and we'll get to those shortly. Before we get started with our incident commander, I'd like to read a statement from the Larimer County Sheriff's Office. The Larimer County Sheriff's Office and the fire team continue to evaluate the current evacuation areas and changes will be made as conditions allow. This week, we were able to downgrade two mandatory evacuation areas to voluntary and completely remove two voluntary evacuation areas. The Sheriff's Office continues to provide 24 seven security patrols of the evacuation areas and the fire perimeter as we have since the fire started. The credentialing system for access to evacuation areas is working and we are grateful so many residents were able to get their credentials. If you live in or own property property in a mandatory evacuation area and do not have a credential, there is still time. You can visit Larimer.org and click on the Cameron Peak Fire info link at the top of any page for details about getting your credentials. So with that, we'll start with an update from Incident Commander Dave Gesser. Hi, good evening, Dave Gesser, Incident Commander with the Southwest Area Team 3. So really no change in the fire size. We're still at 102,596 acres. Um, we did, since our last meeting we had, we did go up to 15% containment. And the majority of that, let me step to the other side, is here at Tango. Um, with a lot of great work on, with folks on the ground and they're really getting that area secured. They continue to patrol that area um, and monitoring it as well to make sure that nothing does happen to pop up any new hot spots or anything in there. Um, working, we're just right at about 970 personnel on the fire still at this time. The big thing is, is a lot of work going on up here on the thumb and Corey will talk to that in a little bit. Um, we did lose one of our, or two of our type one helicopters, which is our heavy helicopters. And that was due to a new start up in Wyoming. Um, a lot of things going on with that fire. So we did lose a few, but with that, we brought in what we call seats. And those are small fixed wing aircraft, kind of like uh, your crop dusters um, that are able to deliver retardants. So we brought in five of those today, along with the remaining helicopters that we have to be able to put some retardant in here and try to keep this in check because we have people going direct in there as well. So that was a change today. So you might have seen quite a bit of aircraft flying there. And that's what that was, was really to help us out with losing some of those helicopters. Those small airplanes are able to get lower to the ground versus the large air tankers. So they're able to have more of an accuracy with that delivery of that retardant. So that's why we went that way. Thank you. Next, we have planning operations trainee, Corey Carlson. Uh, good evening. Um, so I'll give you a little update on the fire um, today. So like Dave mentioned, um, we're at 15% containment. And basically it starts right here in the Glen Echo rustic area, coming along the, the fire's edge to the Pingree Park Road. And then here's where our new containment is, from the Pingree Park Road down to, to the Buckhorn Road. So all this is looking really, really good. Uh, very few smokes in here, not picking up anything on the infrared. And we'll continue to have some engines patrol this um, all, all day, every day for as long as we're here. So um, as we leave Buckhorn and go uh, into this uniform, division uniform, up here towards uh, Beaver Creek Hourglass, this stuff's looking really, really good. We're not, we're not quite ready to show containment on the map, but we're getting real close. They are still picking up some areas of heat. Um, 
here and there. So it looks really good. You know, with the CSU Mountain College here, we just, we really want to make sure this is, you know, 100%, no smokes, no heat before we show containment. We did put a little bit of dozer line from the fire's edge down to tie into a road system here, um, just to kind of keep, you know, any potential fire from scooting out of here. There is a road system that, that runs through here. So that's kind of a, kind of an alternate little uh, road system we have there, just in case something was just scoot on out. Like I've mentioned several times before, as we leave Comanche Reservoir and get in this, this part, just not able to access this with equipment or personnel. It's just, it's too steep, it's too dangerous to put people in there. And if we put some, if we did get someone in there and they got hurt, we wouldn't be able to get them out. So and the other thing with this big horseshoe, I just wanna make a note of, there's a reason why a lot of this stuff didn't burn. And the reason why is a lot of this is high elevation tundra. There's there's not a whole lot, it's, it's rocky. There's not a whole lot that can burn in there. You know, there are some avenues where, where fire could get through, but there hasn't been any heat in those areas or infrared hasn't been picking up anything in there, those areas since the snow, snow fell. So things looking pretty good in there. Uh, down where the fire has gotten onto the park, uh, we continue to work in the Chapin Creek, Chapin Pass area. For the last three days, we've run a type one helicopter and two type two helicopters for, for the majority of the morning. We're trying to really smash the smokes that pop up there and kind of just put a nail in the coffin of the of this stuff in the park so looking really good in there we'll continue to do that as we get these smokes popping up there but no boots on the ground in, in the park at this time as we come around um, this long dry area looking really really good um, we're really close to putting containment in here um, just just want to hold off a little bit longer uh, on this piece today we did get the division group supervisor up uh, this afternoon, he did a recon of this and uh, no visible smoke showing from, from here on back to the Long Jaw Road. So I think I had mentioned before, we've, we've never been able to get boots on the ground here because of the uh, inaccessibility and the terrain. There's nowhere to land. Um, there's, you know, tundra out here, just, just pretty challenging country. So uh, we flew that today, no visible smokes. So this is, this is all looking really good. Like I said, we're not showing it contained but you know, we, we don't really have any concerns in that area. As we come up here, you're start, gonna start seeing a, some X's on the, on the map. These are areas that we've worked with a combination of dozer line or crews. So we've, we've put a little dozer line in here. We've had some crews working in here. This is really steep, nasty country, uh, just above the 103 road. Um, and then right here, this is completed dozer line. So again, we, we continue to try to piece things together where we can. We've had crews working in this area and they'll continue to just hot spot and kind of look for heat along this edge. There may not actually be um, actual hand line in there, but they'll continue to work these areas from where there is line here back to here and continue to look for heat and smoke. Um, as we come around here again, this has been worked pretty pretty heavily by crews. Hasn't been much activity, hasn't been much heat. And then it, we've tied into this dozer line here. Um, coming to the this area, this is kind of our trouble area still. Um, we've, we've tried to get equipment in here and we're just having a really hard time getting access in there. We've come up to this 5, 517 road and we started pushing some dozer lines in on these spur roads trying to get better access. So, so one here, there's a spur road here, there's another one there, and then we push the dozer line in here. And what we're just trying to do is just get a little bit closer access to get crews in there. This is still, you know, from this spur road to this fire edge is, is about a mile and a half. And that mile and a half is pretty, pretty rocky, pretty steep, pretty nasty to get folks in there. And the thing is, with, with fire activity, increased fire activity in this area. Once we get folks in there, you know, we have to be able to get them out in, a, in, in time. So really challenging ground here. This, this was fairly active today. It's, it's kind of gotten more active. It's, it's not really wanting to grow or move a ton, but it is getting a little bit wider. It is increasing in activity and it's gonna remain a, kind of our problem area. We did have two crews in here, two hotshot crews in here. 
We're supposed to get two more by the end of the weekend. And as, as conditions allow, we will continue to work the fire's edge direct as long as fire doesn't chase them out of there. But it's gonna be, it's gonna be challenging. This is, you know, one mile, two mile, three, almost four miles across, you know, with, with crews, you know, with increased fire activity in there. So uh, we hit that again with aviation. Dave mentioned it. Um, I think we've, we, best guess was about 70,000 gallons of retardant and water delivered to this area via helicopter and single engine air tankers. So, um, you know, that puts us over about 200,000 gallons over the last four days, and we're still getting increased activity. So we'll continue to watch that. We'll continue to work that, and that'll continue to be our big priority. As we get down here on the Highway 14 corridor, this triangle is looking really good. This corridor is looking really good. We're not concerned about fire moving this way or this way. Uh, so Kanicki Nick, Spencer, all those areas, the tunnel, everything's looking pretty good in here. As we come along the Highway 14 corridor east, we just continue to patrol this and monitor this with engines. We're not concerned with fire activity in here. Um, we're not comfortable putting containment on the map. Just there's always potential for this, this fire if it was to, to move out of here to push back this way. So we continue to work in and around the structures in here. We continue to mop up the edge, uh, but looks real good in there. Um, so that's brought me back, back around. Um, I'll, I'll mention a little bit of stuff down here in the park, these communities. Um, you know, we've, we've worked with the park, we've worked with uh, the resource advisors, we've come up with a really good plan of basically some point protection, some st strategic points uh, in and around these communities should fire move that way. We're not anticipating it moving that way. We don't plan on implementing any of the work down here unless fire forces us to do that. And we have action points that if a fire was to reach a certain area, it would it would cause a reaction for us to do certain actions down there. So that plan is in place down there. Um, you can see this kind of mess of stuff up here. What this is, is um, we're work currently working the Dead Man Road down to the Manhattan Road. And what we're trying to do with these X's, this is dozer line, and we're just trying to straighten things up. It may not look all that straight on the map, but. You know, we have some scattered private property in here. We have some forest ground, and we're just trying to piece together some of these roads, trying to straighten things up so that uh, it just makes it easier for us to defend when we have more straight lines than uh, the, the windy roads. It's really hard for us to uh, work these things uh, when we don't have straight lines. So it looks pretty messy, but we're piecing things together in here, trying to stay as much on federal ground as possible and off private property. but. As you can see, this is coming together, is, is kind of making a, a secondary line of defense should this fire go this way. So this is a mixture of roads, dozer lines, and then we have, we continue to have crews working, you know, primarily now in the Crystal Lakes Red Feather area. This is kind of our biggest concern with kind of structure protection type stuff. We're, we're, uh, we've moved a lot of equipment from here up to here and really kind of hitting this hard. Glacier view, uh, a little bit less activity. You can see some dozer line in here. We got our, the red feather road here, and we'll continue to piece things together around there. But these will these will be a little bit more a higher priority currently, just because of their proximity to the fire. Uh, and then, you know, this kind of boundary that we've got going here. Uh, I think I've pretty much got around around the horn. So uh, with that, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Thanks. All right, so we're gonna move into our Q&A session. Um, just so you guys know, we've had a couple people ask about zooming into the map. Um, we're unable to do that tonight. We've moved to a new location since we last saw you guys on Wednesday. But we did drop at the top of this video, there's a link to NC Web where you guys can look at all the maps you want. And then uh, we are answering that with the actual map link within the comments. So with that, we'll get started with question and answer. So we'll start with our incident commander, Dave Gesser. 
Can you um, address, a couple of folks are asking about donations to the firefighters. Yeah, and so good question, we've had that before. You know, our firefighters are taken care of very well um, with all the supplies they need. Some of the things we do ask folks to do is be able to take those donations to any of the Red Cross shelters with a lot of folks being evacuated, your local fire departments, uh, whether they're volunteer departments or not. And then there's also the Wildland Firefighter Foundation that really helps to support uh, families that are in need with uh, the loss of a loved one on these wildland firefighter for these wildland firefighters. Um, you know, and we did have, and I'll, I'll bring it out, and I don't know all the details to things, but there was a fatality on a fire over in California as of yesterday um, with one of our local firemen. So that's one of the things, and when I mean local firemen, it's one of the, the fire, the wildland firefighting community. Um, so with that Wildland Firefighter Foundation, they help those families to be over there um, where the incident happens, help with any hospital things, and really just help supply that family. All right, switching over, uh, our, first, our next question will be, where is all of the smoke in Estes coming from? So a lot of the smoke's coming from the, the West Coast. Um, there's a lot of fires going on, particularly in California. Um, and that smoke is currently with the winds directions is blowing over into here. Um, very little, I mean, we do have some smoke production coming from the thumb area, but very little production there. And so most of this you're seeing is coming from the West Coast. All right, next question. Is there a resource that I can look into in order to make a plan for mitigation on any future fire? I have a small property on Crystal Mountain. Yeah, so they've posted that in some of the previous Facebooks we've done. And you can reach out to the local fire department or with the local forest service um, or state, county, and they can give you the information for that contact. There's also a lot of times there's uh, folks that do that, um, do mitigation for around structures and things, but you can reach out to them and they can help you with that. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we'll bring back up planning operations training, Corey Carlson. So Corey, your first question is, winds aren't looking good in Red Feather's favor. Can you speak to the wind weather concerns for tomorrow? Because it seems like it might be a rough day. Uh, yeah, so um, as far as the wind direction, uh, you're right. It, winds tomorrow are gonna be out of the Southwest. Um, so, you, you know, kind of pushing it towards the area where we're working, you know, like I said, you know, we, we've had some southwest winds uh, the last couple days, southeast, southwest, and, and the fire's just, you know, it's moving, but but not, it's, it's not wanting to get up and, and really move. We're keeping it in check with the retardant with the helicopters, but you're right, it is out of the southwest. Um, you know, I'm, we're going to get an increase of winds, you know, 15 to 20 miles an hour for the next couple days, but with that, we're also going to get some cloud cover. We're also going to get chances of precip um, and, and that'll raise the humidity levels. So anytime we can get the relative humidity levels up, you know, fire activity uh, tends to diminish. We will have the winds, um, but we do have an increase in, uh, you know, into early next week of moisture. It's it's not a lot, 20 to 30%, but it, it, it will help. Next question is, where is the fire most active? So the fire is most active is most active right here. I know it doesn't look like much, but it's about a mile, uh, about a mile here. And then we 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 do have it. It's it's kind of branched out a little bit further. It's you know a lot of there's more smoke, there's more fire. Some of this stuff's a little bit more interior, but this stuff right here is fairly active. It's it's kind of right on the edge, but we it, it does continue to kind of move to the west a little bit. Uh, we have someone asking, um, how is Hooter Springs area? It, it's good. I mean, all this area, you know, over here has been worked. Um, it's, we're showing containment. Um, and yeah, anything, anything uh, along this line or east of here is looking really well, as well as this Highway 14 corridor. And then from Buckhorn down to 385 is all looking really good. 
Uh, next, someone is asking if you could explain a little bit more of what's happening in Division Uniform. Division Uniform. So Division Uniform runs from Buckhorn right along this fire's edge past the CSU Mountain Campus and then pretty much to right above Comanche Reservoir. So what they're doing there is with using dozers, heavy equipment and hand crews, they're going right along the fire's edge and putting, you know, using a combination of uh, direct fire line construction with crews and equipment, as well as looking for, you know, hot spot and cold trailing. And when I say that, it's, it's basically, you know, they're going right along the fire's edge with the back of their hand looking for heat. You know, they line out and they, they move in a systematic grid and they're, they're just feeling for heat all along this edge. It's pretty meticulous, it's pretty monotonous, and it's, it's pretty time consuming, consuming, especially when you consider from Buckhorn to Comanche is probably eight or nine miles. So um, a, lot of, a lot of meticulous work going on down there. That's why it takes so long to complete it. All right, thank you, Corey. Um, Incident Commander Dave Gesser again. So we have a couple different questions in regards to containment. Someone is asking when we think it may be possible to reach 25% containment. Um, others are asking how we determine containment, what that looks like. Okay, um, good question. You know, as Corey mentioned, with folks going in here in uniform, um, with cold trailing, hot spotting, checking that area, really working any hot spots that they find by kind of stirring the material, if they have water available, which they were able to find ways to plug in some hose in here and able to use water in this area. So really just ensuring that that ground's been truth, they've walked it several times, just continuing to patrol that. And then when they feel things are good and our divisions out there feel comfortable with it, they'll call it contained. And as Corey mentioned, you know, looking at this area, they're looking at starting to put some containment in here over the next few days. And so with containment, um, we take the entire perimeter of the fire. So this is 237 miles of perimeter. So they take that and then depending on how much containment they put on a map, that then determines that percentage of that 237 acres. All right, next question is in regards to having a weather meteorologist available to explain more about the weather to the public. Yeah, so we do have a, me a weather meteorologist that we have on site here that gives us briefings um, every evening and in the mornings on the weather predictions. Um, we can look at trying to put that up but maybe on our next live, um, but we can produce some things that he produces for us that we could put on the, um, on the site as well. But he does go through a matrix that gives us really the percent of weather, the cloud percent, the temperatures, the RHs, the possibility of moistures, winds, wind direction. And he has some weather sites that are set up out and around the fire that he pays pretty particular attention to. And so we get weather specific to the fire area. All right, thank you. We'll bring uh, Corey Carlson back up. All right, Corey, your question is, how is Comanche Reservoir Beaver Creek Trail area? Uh, so Comanche Reservoir is good. No impacts to Comanche Reservoir. The fire is north of that, as well as Beaver Creek. Uh, you can see the fire's edge right here. Beaver Creek's right in here. They did put some uh, dozer line in here from the fire's edge down towards the Beaver Creek, but no impacts to those two areas from the fire. And we don't anticipate any to those areas either. So the next question uh, they're asking is everything within the pink area burned or is there areas that still have like green vegetation in them? Could you just explain more on that fire perimeter and area within? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So this is the fire perimeter and this does look, you know, this, this shows as basically burned. This doesn't mean that every inch of this perimeter is, is black in there. Um, you know, it, it, you know, there's some mosaic areas in there. There's some areas that, that didn't burn, um, you know, but there, you know, I'll be honest, there's some pretty high severity stuff in here. And then there's areas where, you know, there's, there's big pockets of, of green. So, you know, that, that is intermixed throughout here. I couldn't tell you what, you know, 
what specifically is, is green still and what what took some high severity stuff i i know some of this stuff down here was was fairly high severity and then as you can imagine in those three days you know this this fire basically made eight mile runs um three consecutive days in a row right through the middle through the top and and through here you guys all saw the well a lot of you probably saw the big smoke columns and, and there was some fairly um, active fire, you know, some fairly se severe fire in there, but there's a lot of green as well. Next question is how far from the fire's edge on the thumb is Red Feather Lakes? Um, so I'll just estimate, but each one of these squares is a, a mile. So one, two, three, four, you're looking at about five miles, five, six miles from, from this area to you know, kind of the outskirts of Red Feather. So the next question for our incident commander is going to be, be um, how does retardant work? Okay, so <laughs> it's a good question. Um, retardant, basically what it is, is it's a, a chemical that's mixed in with water. So when they put retardant into that area, it helps to dry out those fuels. Again, with that, it, you know, penetrating the fuel layer, trying to get it down to the ground to where it dries out those fuels enough that it buys the folks on the ground to be able to get in there to those areas and really work those areas. Retardant by itself won't stop a fire. You have to be able to back that up by ground resources, whether that's crews, engines, um, heavy equipment. So that's basically, you know, how it would work with the retardant. What are the biggest difference between how the retardant works and using water? Why would you choose one over the other? That's a good question. Um, you know, the water typically helps us to be able to put out some flames to reduce that humidity with, to actually, sorry, raise the humidity in the fuels that lessens the burning of the fuels. So what it does is that as well, it allows folks to get in there and be able to have some of that water accessible to work the ground, but it basically raises the RH as to where the retardant dries out the fuel. And it also, what that does then, and it lowers the fuel moisture within the fuels. So a third part to that question is where do you get that water when you're fighting the fire? And is the drought threatening your water source? So no, you know, the drought's not. So we do, we do that in a lot of different ways. We set up what we call pumpkins. Um, they're almost like a above ground swimming pool in a way um, that we use water tenders, whether it's through the city water, town water, uh, reservoirs, and we bring that water into those areas. A lot of the other times we get what they're pre-approved dip sites and a dip site is where a helicopter can pull water up out. So utilizing the reservoirs and lakes that are around the area, we get approval for that to be able to do that. Knowing that, you know, we do have the threatened and endangered species as well. As well. So when our helicopters do do that, we keep the one helicopter to that area. If we were gonna move that helicopter to a different dip site, we have to bring that helicopter in and clean that bucket before we allow them to dip out of another one so we don't cross contaminate. All right, next question is in regards to resources, how we uh, release resources, how do we keep them and what that's gonna look like moving forward as containment could increase. Okay, good question. So with that, you know, even with the team sizes that we talked about, most resources go for 14 days. Um, and then they go back to their home units and get, it's a mandatory two days off. Um, some resources can extend out to 21 and we have been doing a lot of extensions of resources to 21 days. And then they go back home and they'll get two to three days off. But it, operations and Corey does a lot of this because he's what we call the planning ops. So he, follows the resources in their last work day. And so they're ahead of that time, they're trying to order in more resources to be able to replace the ones as they leave. Um, some of the resources are local and we're able to get them right back. Others like your hotshot crews, they're national resources. They're in a high demand. 
but within the region, um, we have worked with folks to be able to bring back like Roosevelt hot shots, the Pike hot shots. So they'll go home for a couple of days, get some rest and be able to come back. Um, we also work like within our team as well. Some of my operations section chiefs are unable to go, you know, 14, more than 14 days because of prior commitments. So we have brought in other ops chiefs, which are part of my team as well. Um, to replace those folks. And then, you know, there was a question answered, and I'll go ahead and answer this as well. And what that question was basically, why is Corey Carlson still a trainee when he's doing a great job? So a lot of our folks, and I don't disagree, he's doing a great job. Um, we have task books is what we call them, and folks have to work through tasks to be able to get signed off. And so you go through several assignments until your trainer is ready to sign you off. Um, and then it has to go through a big committee, but you know, Corey's been doing a great job and it's just part of the process that we all have to go through to be able to learn and move on to the next level within things. Um, all of us have to do that. Um, it's a way of ensuring that folks are ready to move on to that next step. And I can tell you, Corey is at that level. So. All right, uh, next question is we've had a lot of people asking about the status of evacuations, road closures, and where can they go to find more information? So with that, um, Larimer County Sheriff's, they have their post that's out there and we have had that on the news releases. So if you look at our news releases, you can go to their site and it'll give you that information on that. Um, one of the things that just came out today as well is the Forest Service working with our operations section did shrink the forest closure. Um, and so what that does is it allows us for areas just as Laramie County Sheriff's works with us to be able to let folks back in as we feel comfortable with doing that. So we work really close with our partners to be able to work on those. And doing that, you know, we know that especially in the river corridor as well on the 14. Um, a lot of folks and a lot of access in there for being able to get in the fish in the river. Um, so we look at the potential for the fire in that area, the containment in those areas um, to be able to reduce some of that. All right, thank you. All right, question for operations is, is back burning part of the plan if this thumb decides it's going to move? Yeah, so back burning is always an option. It's something that we use all the time. And, and what that is, is, is basically back burning is, so we'll just take this dozer line, for example. Say this dozer line is, is 100 feet wide. Um, what a back burn does is, is, is if this fire was approaching this line, uh, 100 feet isn't always wide enough. And, and what, what we could do is as this fire is approaching, we can start lighting fire along the 100 foot wide dozer line. And as that fire starts to move this way towards the fire, it just increases the depth. And the more depth we have, um, you know, the, the harder it is for this fire to cross over. So, you know, typically, you know, 100 foot wide dozer line, you start your back burning, you just continue to follow that line and you just increase the, the depth and kind of eliminate the opportunities for this fire to get across there. So that does come with some challenges. You know, you have to factor the wind. Um, sometimes back burning is best done at night um, when there's cooler temperatures, when the RH is higher. The other thing that's a real challenge on this fire with back burning is the fuel type. As some of you know that live in this area, this is heavily, uh, this country has been heavily impacted by the bark beetle. In some places, 70% of the overstory is standing dead. So anytime you initiate fire on your own in conditions with a heavy fuel loading or 70% standing dead, that just typically causes problems. Those, it's just, you're adding more fuel to the fire and sometimes it, it can cause a few more challenges. I wouldn't say back burning's out of the question on this incident, but um, the situation with the fuel loading and the amount of dead trees, um, it would, would make it pretty challenging. So uh, certainly it's on the table, but it's not something that we're looking at currently. Thank you. All right, 
for incident commander. Are the flights with retardant maximized? So example, would more flights, if possible, have a greater effect on the Northeast thumb? Good question. So, you know, with, as I mentioned, with the seats being in there and the helicopters, um, we've got what's available right now to us um, and they are continuously flying um, in those areas. So we are maximizing the use of that aircraft at this time. And so it is helping. Um, it's, you also have to look at that airspace and how much aircraft can you put into one small area as well. All right, another aviation question. Can you speak to helicopter crew duty hours and mandated rest and also the importance of maintenance personnel and support of the aircraft? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so, you know, our helicopters, basically they have, and our air attacks that are up in the air, they have an eight hour flight day. Um, so we have to really utilize that aircraft with at appropriate time. So, because if you continuously just get them up first thing in the morning, shut them down, you know, and fly them, once they hit that eight hour time frame, they have to shut down and have rest. Um, with our air attacks, they have, we have two different air attacks that are up in the air and they take shifts. So they go for several hours at a time, they land, and then the next one comes up. Um, with the helicopters, you know, you can, with the pilots, you get what we call relief pilots, but that's only after those pilots have uh, been on the fire for up to 14 days as well. And that varies with them. Some pilots go 10 days, some pilots go 12 days, some go eight days. It just depends on their contracts they have. As far as any support equipment and things with them, you know, I couldn't give you the specifics on the hours, but there's like your 100 hour flight checks, that they're their 100 hour maintenance they have to do. They have a thousand hour maintenance. And some of them are a day check. Some of them are two to three day checks. And so there's a lot that goes into those checks with those helicopters with all the mechanics they have. So they do have mechanics here as well. They have their fuel tenders and all the support needs there. But when you get into those like thousand hour maintenance schedules they have to work through, then it's required a lot more maintenance there, a lot more mechanics coming in and working with those helicopters. And that shuts them down for up to three days. All right, thank you. So we'll bring up operations. Have the homes in Red Feather and Crystal Lakes been assessed in case the fire reaches those areas? Yep, so, uh, you know, there's several thousand homes in here. Uh, we, you know, even prior to us being here, these, these homes were assessed. And when, when I talk about being assessed, you know, it's, it, it can be really quick. You know, these guys run around with iPads. We have a, a program on there and they're just checking boxes. You know, it asks what kind of, you know, what type of roof does the, the home has? You know, is it stucco, is it wood siding? You know, does it have, uh, is it on a well or does it have city water? Does it propane? All those things go into uh, determining, you know, what kind of structure mitigation measures we need. Um, so all, you know, as far as I know, all the, the homes in Crystal Lakes and Red, Red Feather have been assessed at some point or another, we've collected that data. And what we do is we put it into a structure protection plan. And what that structure protection plan is basically tells us what kind of equipment, what kind of how much hose we need, what kind of water supply we're going to need to, you know, you know, basically protect these homes. So we currently have, you know, miles and miles of hose strung out in, in here. We have pumps, we have pumpkins that basically, like Dave said, is above ground uh, swimming pool and yeah all this stuff's been assessed and it'll continue to continue to be assessed and continue to work in there next question is the line protecting glacier view from the west completed yeah so pri the priority right now is 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 this this piece moving this way with with the southwest wind so you can see the dozer line here you can see some of the dozer line here and we do have this you know the uh dead man you know and then yeah, it's kind of busy in here but we got this manhattan road and then the dead man road um yeah here and so that's that's our basically our c contingency line there we are continuing to put stuff you know right along the private boundary 
uh, but here and that work is is ongoing. All right, next question for you is Rocky Mountain National Park able to do anything to contain? Yeah, so this stuff in Rocky Mountain Park is is, is pretty inaccessible. Um, you know, currently only showing one smoke kind of in this shaping area. It, it's it's a nuisance smoke. It's you know it, it wants to pop up every day, but we're we're hammering it with aviation and and the, the water buckets. But um, we don't want to come in here and just start putting you know all kinds of lines and dozer lines in there. That's just not you know it's there's no reason to. Um, so this this a lot of this stuff is up in the rocks. Um, a lot of stuff that's not going to want to burn. So we'll continue to just hit it with uh, water and, and we feel pretty confident that, you know, eventually that'll just go away on its own. All right, thank you, Corey. Um, we've got one more question. I will give that to the incident commander. It says, how often do all the agencies meet to discuss current situation and plans for the future situation? And what agency are, agencies are involved in those meetings? All right. so good question so we do we meet with all the agencies on a daily basis with the ICs um, with the ops group they do meet with um, Larimer County Sheriff's on a daily basis along with uh, let me get this straight here <laughs> the state um, and all the other fire departments as well but the uh, big thing is is the with the ICs and the Agent, what we call agency administrators. So you've got um, the, Rava, the Rajo Roosevelt, we have Rocky Mountain National Park, we have Larimer County Sheriffs. Um, geez, you're gonna get me with this question. Um, the state and the uh, fire protection zones. So we meet with those folks on a daily basis. We have what we call a tactics meeting as well. Um, to discuss tactics and moving forward. Um, and then we also meet with, uh, as I said, our cooperators. We have what we call cooperator meetings and those are our liaisons meet with them uh, once a day, um, if not several times throughout the day on the phone, but then they have meetings with them every other day as well. So we are in constant communication. Um, if there's anything that's needed, um, we have a text group that we reach out to the agency administrators. They respond back to us rather quickly. And so we, that coordination has happened continuously throughout the day, but face, well, some face to face and some Zoom with the world, you know, that we're in with the COVID. We do sit down and have those discussions on a daily basis. All right, thank you. All right, with that, we're gonna go ahead and call it for tonight. We wanna to thank you guys for joining in with us and all the amazing support you've been giving. We make sure we pass that along to our firefighters. We know it's important, the work they're doing to protect not only themselves, but protect you and your community. So on behalf of the Southwest area team, we wanna thank you for that continued support. If you're watching this after the fact, you can still go ahead and drop questions in here. We'll have public information officers monitoring for those. We'll do the best we can to get those answers or direct you to where you can go to get more information. If you uh, don't know already, you can also hop on NCWeb. That link is also attached on this page. Feel free to send us a private Facebook message or give us a call with any questions you may have. And with that, we'd like to thank you again and have a good evening.